Okay, okay. Welcome to the very end of VB 2019. Uh, welcome to the very end of the 29th uh, Fires Built and Conference. Uh, you got me on stage soon uh, for a few more minutes and then we'll announce the location for VB 2020. Uh, but before that, you have what I hope to be one of the highlights of the conference. It's, it's the closing keynote. I've, I've, I first saw Haroon give a keynote at a conference in Germany four and a half years ago. Um, which was one of these legendary talks you see. Uh, the few people that, that, that I sometimes see that were there, we still talk about, uh, it is China, it's an in-joke. <laughs> uh, and Adrian gave a talk at VB 2016 in Denver. Uh, and one of these rare occasions where we say, okay, we're not going to be very strict with time, and we'll let him run a bit longer because it's such an interesting discussion going on. So um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Harun Mir and Adrian Sanabria from Thingst uh, to the closing keynote. So over to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, so thanks for coming out today. Thanks for sticking around for us, staying late. We appreciate it. I'm Adrian, as, uh, as he said, and that's Haroon. Beard one, beard two. Much beardage. We both came uh, from about a jillion miles away. Uh, from different locations. Um, I'm actually the one employee in Thinks that lives in the US. Everyone else is in South Africa. And between the two of us, we've seen the industry from a lot of different perspectives over the years, over a lot of years. <clears throat> a couple decades, I think, four decades between the two of us, maybe. Uh, as a sysadmin, developer, blue team, red team, I was an industry analyst for a while, so I wrote about the industry. I talked to investors. Um, Haroon has also, you know, starting a company, owning a company, talking to investors, and we're now both at Thinkst. So state of play in the industry. Uh, by the numbers, uh, a lot of things are getting crazy. One of them is products. And this is a pretty ubiquitous slide. You know, I think a lot of decks, we, we see these, this slide. I think it's great that someone at Momentum uh, Partners sits around and copies and pastes uh, logos into this all day. It must be a full-time job keeping this up. <laughs> I mean, just imagine, I don't know what they build that in, but you know, that, that's gotta be a, a gigabyte PDF you know, or, or whatever they're, they're creating that in. So, so many, Vendors in the industry, you know, you could easily, you know, this is just what RSA looks like. This is the floor plan if you're getting a booth there. Um, but there's enough vendors in the industry that you could fill easily three uh, RSAs, including all the little startup vendor areas we have now. RSA is so big that uh, it's extended out to uh, the Marriott. You know, it's, it's, it, there's vendors all over the place. They'll have vendors in uh, coffee shops and restaurants uh, a couple years out. Uh, another thing that's grown huge by the numbers, uh, security conferences, 111 uh, this year, 585 worldwide in 173 cities and 52 countries. Uh, but I'm joking here because that's just B-sides. That's just the B-sides franchise. <clears throat> So actually, there's 2,083 conferences this year. If you pull out all the stuff that you'd argue with me is not really a conference, like training stuff, job fairs, stuff like that. So a lot of conferences. Uh, full tenfold from what we saw uh, less than 10 years ago. Uh, so less than 10 years ago, we used to say, wow, there's almost a security conference for every day of the year. Now we'll leave one security conference to go check out another security conference and then maybe go to a third all in the same day. You know, if you uh, attend Black Hat at all, you know what I mean. You might run over to uh, uh, B-Sides Las Vegas and then, uh, you know, other ones have popped up around the same time. DEF CON itself is a series of conferences in one. Each village is its own conference with its own budget, with its own CFP, so it's crazy. So this made me wonder, with this many conferences, how bad does overlap get? And on June 4th, 2019, we had uh, 19 security conferences in one day, or at least starting on one day. You know, I'm sure they all ran different lengths. And so many that that wasn't even 19, there was another four that I hadn't shown you. 
That's how, that's how many 19 in one day looks like. And that's all over the world. That's Australia, that's North America, that's uh, uh, the UK. Of course, the, the dirty secret that um, people who are in offense, people who are pen testing, or people doing incident response know, is that for all the products that we have and all the conferences that are going on, it's not significantly harder to break into places. Okay, so pen testers, leave them alone for a short while on an internal network. It's still clubbing baby seals. Um, the, the stats back in the 2012, uh, 2012 Verizon DBIR said that 92% of orgs had to be told by a third party when they were compromised. Um, Adrian points out that in retail, currently 100% um, need to be informed by a third party. Um, Mandiant in 2015 said that the median time before someone discovered they were being attacked was 205 days. IBM Ponemon just put up a study this year to say it's 206 days. Um, and so for the most part, what we're saying is there's a zillion products, there's a zillion conferences, there's a lot of money being thrown into it, and for the most part, none of it materially impacts attackers. And so the question for us is, why? Um, and for the most part, that's what we're trying to uh, look at today, because we've got some hypotheses, um, and at the end, you'll get a chance to tell us why we idiots. Um, like most things, um, it's a combination, we feel, of nature, nurture, and incentives. Um, and we boil it down largely to these three things. Um, when we're building security companies, we raise money badly, we build products badly, and we do sales badly. Um, so we'll start with raising money badly, and we'll start with something non-confrontational. Uh, non For InfoSec companies, the VC model is broken, okay? And it's really easy to pick on VCs because they push for growth and they uh, invest in exits, they don't invest in companies. But I'm not even talking about that because fairly recently a smart investor told me, hey, that's the game, like that's what we do. We're investing money, we're hoping for a good exit. You're a founder, you run your company the way you run your company and we'll both work. So, so I'm not even talking about those. The two things that I do want to talk about, though, the two things that I think make the security ecosystem poorer is uh, the fact that they introduce complexity and, and something that we're calling proxy boost. Um, complexity is fairly simple. Um, if, if you are pitching a VC, um, typically what you want to go to them with um, this year is something like this. So, so you have a good Ivy League education and you say we're crawling the dark web at scale, we're adding some machine learning, and we're doing something with uh, APT. And this would hold up really well against an ex admin who says we're going to solve the local admin password problem on machines. But actually, if someone built a, pro a, a product that solved the local admin password problem on machines, they'd impact millions of customers, much more than any machine learning dark web um, IOCs are going to. And, and part of this is why you end up seeing every year's RSA have a theme, right? Because there's been a swath of companies that's now been invested in that's now pushing out the latest hotness, okay? And it doesn't matter that we haven't solved problems since the late 80s or 90s, it's the new hotness that gets new investment, and that's where people go. Um, the second one is a little more vague, mainly because we made up this term, um, and, and that's the fact that VCs kind of boost proxies. And, and what I'm talking about here goes a little further back, and, and the problem is, in the InfoSec industry, most customers can't tell if products are good or bad. Um, and in the absence of being able to tell whether a product is good or bad, they use other proxies. And unfortunately, most of these proxies are pretty flawed. So, so for example, if, if your company looks big and you've got lots of good salespeople, or if you've got a massive booth at Black Hat, or a massive booth at RSA, you're imbued with a type of credibility that has nothing to do with whether you have a product or not, or whether your product actually works or not. And, and this causes a specific problem um, that makes VC investment dangerous. So typically when, when VCs work with consumer software, 
um, there'll be a founder who'll come along who either has a POC or s solves a problem, and VCs will come in and give him money for his first round. Um, and with this bunch of founders who try, some of them will get some users, and those who do will get another bunch of money. And at some point, one person wins all of the users, and they and their VC get together and celebrate an IPO. Okay, it's a, it's a little bit Darwinian, but it kind of works. You, you end up with something that's reasonable. The problem that we have is because of this bad information, um, the bad information asymmetry that customers have in InfoSec, you end up with something like this with security sales. So you have a founder, VCs give them money, but what that money allows them to do is buy those proxies that make their products look reasonable or legitimate. So once the, once the VCs have injected money into the business, you get this first class of sales that make VCs go, well, you've got customers, it's time for your second round of funding. Okay, and there are currently so many customers who will try anything once because why not? that this process ends up running a lot longer than it should. So bad products last a lot longer in the marketplace. It's, it's why you see so much hatred for InfoSec products, because people know they spend money on them, they know they buy them, and they're making no material difference uh, to anyone. And this isn't something that the VCs want either, because they're investing in these companies, and actually, fundamentally, the products, uh, for the most part, suck. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is that the money ends up muddying the water um, when actually what they're looking for is clarity. Um, so we're going to move on to building products badly. And interestingly, the first thing that comes up again is a question of complexity. Okay? And um, we've known forever that complexity was the opposite of security. Um, Schneier wrote an article a while back saying... Complexity is the worst enemy you could have. Um, he was pretty prescient. Um, he goes on to say, listen, normal products can have flaws, and you'll discover them in beta testing, but you won't discover security flaws with beta testing. And he ends the article by saying, listen, the way this stuff is going, considering we don't know how to handle complexity, we've got two options. Either we agree that our future is going to be insecure, or we hold back and we start doing stuff simpler. And of course, what's interesting about that is that that was a Schneier article from 99. Okay, since then, um, things have just gone uh, at a more ridiculous pace. Probably the, the most egregious example that everyone likes to beat up on is GPG. Um, Moxie Marlinspike from Signal um, pointed out at some point that if you actually take a look at the GPG uh, man page, it goes on for pages and pages and pages. And in fact, um, Moxie uh, did a check and figures that it's actually longer than Fahrenheit uh, 451. <laughs> um, and what's interesting about that, we'll probably not reach the bottom of this, what's most interesting about that is it's probably why if you ever introduce someone to GPG, one of the first things they do is accidentally mail you their private key. Um, and again, you have to ask yourself, and, and GPG is easy to pick on, but if you install any enterprise security software, you'll almost certainly find that you need to send your staff on training to run that enterprise software. Okay? And, and Facebook manages to win because my granny was able to figure out how to run it. Um, and so if we question why we're doing software like this, you'll bump into um, three big reasons. The one we already spoke about was investors like complexity. Whether they admit it or not, they want to be on the cutting edge of science and technology, not on solving the local admin problem. Um, the second one is part of where InfoSec came from was from our old BOFH roots. Okay, so, so anyone who was a sysadmin or in security in the late 90s, you'd read BOFH articles where Somebody goes along, deletes his user's mail, stupid user, didn't run a backup, and we've kind of pulled that stuff with us. So we make products that are angry all the time. 
Like, well, he should know he should run backups, idiot. That's why he got ransomware. Um, he should know how to exchange, uh, go to a GPG key party to exchange keys. Um, and, and we take this stuff with us, and for the most part, it's why users don't like our products. And, and with that, there's a whole bunch of old tropes that just won't die. Things like security and usability are always opposite. Like they're not, and they don't have to be. But we keep saying that, and so it excuses us from building poor interfaces or building products uh, that actually suck. Um, and, and this stuff leads to insecure products. Uh, that you. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, product insecurity, um, yeah, this is kind of a, yeah, this is a, a special topic um, because it's generally not how we think of our products. Um, but again, this goes back to the money. Uh, you know, where the money comes from instills this need to grow, to move very fast. Uh, and, you know, that gives time to build MVPs and, uh, and functional products, but maybe not secure products. And, you know, we've seen this over and over and over again. You know, many people have pointed it out. Uh, Dino Dezovi here. Um, you know, I, I'm sure everyone here is, is familiar with this painful uh, uh, part of our history here. Um, but really, you know, this isn't the stuff that we're looking at for security flaws because we're buying it to address security flaws, to fill these gaps uh, that we have. And um, over and over and over we see this. In fact, um, the U.S. government uh, put together all their vulnerabilities, all their security issues, and found that, uh, and, and this is a little bit older, this is uh, six years old here, but you know, they found it's, it's still about the same today. About 30% of all their security issues come from security products across the entire U.S. government. Um, and famously, Veracode, a uh, couple years back, took a look at uh, software from different industries and found security second to last uh, in terms of, uh, of product quality with regards to uh, security flaws. Um, so we see it as vendors all the time. So we build a product that, that lives on customer networks, and frequently people would ask us, well, why, don't, why doesn't your product span multiple VLANs? And, and one of the things, it's one of the times we go back to them and say, we're never going to do that. Um, and in our tiny niche, we are the only company I know that doesn't. Everyone else happily spans VLANs uh, for their customers. And what it means is at some point when they are big enough target, they're going to be responsible for actually allowing attackers to hop across uh, customer, customer segments. And for the most part, customers don't seem to know, and the vendors don't seem to care. Um, something uh, similar that happened, when we built version like one of our product, we went and found the best code auditors we could find, and we paid them a whole bunch of money, and they spent months taking the product apart and gave us a nice report on it. Um, and it turns out that that's really, really uncommon. So it turns out that most security products just aren't undergoing any sort of security review. So, so you take the software that's now running at critical parts of your network, uh, normally running with higher privilege levels, and actually, nobody is bothered to audit it for security. And, and again, what's interesting is it's not like these companies are not spending money. They're spending lots of money on other things. They're just not spending it on making their software more secure. And the question of why this is happening, um, again, it's because there's no pushback from customers. So you'll hear that a major firewall appliance actually has a hard-coded username and password allowing everyone to log into it. You patch it and move on. Um, and fundamentally, it's such a breakdown of trust that someone should be going, how can we trust this to be our gatekeeper when for the last four years it's had a hard-coded username and password for some reason? Um, and, and so at this point, it's hard to tell if it's an inability to tell the difference or if it's just indifference. Um, but for the most part, it sucks. Um, so the last one we're going to touch on is us doing sales terribly. And, and I think this one is more complex because it touches on more things. So the, the really old saying used to be, if, you, if a man builds a better mousetrap, the world will beat apart to his door. Okay, and of course, because nobody likes dreamers, people quickly pointed out that that's not true. 
if you build a better mousetrap, mostly the world doesn't care. And actually, you've got to market it, and you've got to do sales and all of that. Um, but it's our contention that that has gone too far, especially with the current model of building software. Um, it seems like we've overcorrected a little too much. So these days, you tell people, it doesn't matter what tech you have. What matters more is your go-to-market strategy. You could have inferior tech as long as you find the right way to get it out to the market. And so typically, um, if, if you start to become a big boy company, you get VC investment, they'll give you this plan for a high-functioning sales and marketing team. And they'll show you how you need to do email blasts and phone calls and get vendor awards and go to conferences and get ads at airports. And, and we're going to talk about almost all of this. Um, so the first one is really easy to kill, right? Um, getting spam emails or spam calls is a ridiculous problem to have. Um, recently, like in the last week, um, on the CISO Relationship Podcast, um, they asked Sunil Yu, who's from Bank of America, that if he had to choose the single biggest security challenge he had to deal with when working at Bank of America, what would it be? And Sunil thought a little bit, and he said, if I had to pick uh, just one, it would be the bazillion vendors that came knocking on my door trying to get a piece of my budget. That whole podcast is essentially on how to deal with vendors because they're such a nightmare. And it's kind of a strange thing that, that you'd ask someone in security what their biggest challenge is, and their challenge is vendors. Um, because you'd think that we were there to, to solve the problem, not create more of them. Um, and then I'll kill advertising really quickly, because um, advertising has a whole other complication. Like if you've been to an airport in the US, you'd have seen an ad like this. And, and for the most part, I just think it's confusing. Like, like, we studied it for a little bit, and, and I'm not sure, is the snake the good guy? Is, is the big cat the good know. guy? Um, like, how does it apply? Like, it, are they using machine learning? Uh, uh, <laughs> like, like, I think many good hours are wasted um, trying to figure this stuff out. Snakes um, get a bad rap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> snakes get a bad rap. Um, so, so we'll ignore that. Um, when it comes to conferences, um, we've written a whole long blog post on, on uh, how, uh, how these work for us. And one of the things we were surprised at, so the first time we did an RSA booth, is that it's really good. Like, as a young vendor, RSA really worked out for us. We met lots of customers, we sold lots of canaries, and we were surprised by it. Um, but, so, so if you're bored, you should go read that blog post. But, but two things are interesting for me um, when you start looking at booths. And that's if you go to the booth, you'll find lots of this stuff. Right? The, the first is some guy showing everyone how to solve a Rubik's Cube. Um, and again, I'm not sure what that has to do with whatever product they were selling. But, but the people seem entertained. Um, and the other one is you can stop by this booth and play in their ball pit. Okay? And, and you see that stuff happening a lot at RSA. Like, people take $250,000 worth of floor space, and they put up a maze of mirrors for you to play in. Um, and for the most part, I think they might as well just take their VC's money and set it on fire. They'll probably get better headlines for it. Um, but, but I think for us as customers, it, it, it gives you this allow myself to quote myself, um, that, that, that if you go to a company uh, on, on the floor, and if they're spending 90% of their time on their gimmick instead of actually showing you their product, then those guys are probably trying to win you over with their marketing dollars, not with their actual product dollars. Um, and again, it's something that we should change. Um, and so at this point, uh, we'll start talking about awards. <laughs> I tried a fancy back <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to toss it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, awards are pretty common to see. You know, this is just my flight to Vegas. Um, on a single flight, you know, I'm seeing awards from the airline, awards from the airport, uh, awards from somebody uh, pushing rum in the airport. Uh, that was in, in Atlanta. Um, 
And yeah, it, it's, it's fairly normal. It's, it's normal to see awards in industries as a way uh, to drum up interest, uh, to show credibility, to show that, you know, hey, not only do we have a product, other people have looked at it, uh, they say it's okay. You know, so from that standpoint, it seems fairly reasonable. Uh, but it can go overboard. So we're going to just take a look at uh, just like a little case study here, basically. And this is Paul. And Paul is the chief marketing officer for a company called Excipitermon. And Excipitermon has been winning awards, you know, uh, the CMO, and this is pretty normal, chief marketing officer, VP, director of marketing is going to sign up for these awards. You know, they're going to put in all this information about the company. Uh, there's some judges. Uh, they're going to take a look at the awards. And, you know, Paul's doing pretty good here. He's got to, you know, we can give him some applause. You know, he's, 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 uh, he's done some good work here. He's got three awards, and, and this is in two months, no less. He's already gotten three awards for his company. And, uh, but the thing is, Paul's fake. I created Paul, and I created Excipitermon, and I actually, I, I got these awards, which are real awards, and, uh, and I paid real money for them. And... Um, <clears throat> You know, so I didn't make these up. You know, the, these are, you know, I, I took the, I filled out the forms, I put in my credit card details, and I won a bunch of awards in, in two months with a fictitious person in a fictitious company. And to my consternation, uh, Paul has been on LinkedIn for two months now, and he's gotten three C-suite level, executive level job offers. Uh, so... <laughs> Screw you, Paul. So who judges these awards? You know, so I, I, I mentioned there's judging going on. You know, and, and you know, I've got to be careful to say there are some good awards out there. There are some organizations out there that put a lot of effort in to, to make it independent, to make it uh, um, uh, worthy of spending time on. You know, where it's not just here's a form, put in a credit card number, and, and we'll... Uh, scribe something on a, uh, on a trophy or an object for you. Uh, but in this case, this is actually one of the bigger awards out there. You know, I found that this was one of the, uh, one of the judges, and he's, he's a radio DJ in New York City, and uh, what was his name? Brimstone. This is Brimstone. So I, you know, I mean, hard to question that. Brimstone is, uh, is checking out your anti-APT gear, see if it's worthy of an award. Of course, everybody gets an award. And they put on galas so you can get dressed up, you can go, you can get your award. Uh, they make it look like that you came up on stage to receive the award. And, and I, I assume these are models. You know, they, these have nothing to do with the company. Most of these award companies uh, where you can just buy the awards uh, are one or two people just operating it out of their house. Uh, you know, there, there's hardly anything there. Um, so yeah, yeah, it looks good with the, with the models and everything here, but when you actually pick up your award, every single person is there because they're going to get an award. Nobody loses. Everyone picks up an award. Uh, and it's just like a coat check. Like you walk up with your ticket, you hand them your ticket, and they hand you your five awards, seven awards, ten awards, however many awards that you bought. Uh, and you go home with a, I don't know if they give you a bag for these. These are pretty heavy obelisks. <clears throat> And then you look at the websites and you find, you know, a lot, of, a lot of them are cookie cutter. What they've done is they've taken this idea of awards and it's so successful. They're like, well, let's do this industry. Let's do this industry. What about these people? They need awards too. You know, so they start popping up. They all look the same. You know, so we did a little OSINT here, took the Google Analytics number. And yeah, you know, this one company, which again is one or two people just cloning a website and setting it up for other, uh, other awards, they're just cloning these sites. You know, and there's, there's a bajillion of them, you know, that will sell you whatever you want with whatever written on there. In fact, some of them say, we won't even have categories for the awards until everyone enters because we don't want to leave anyone out. So <laughs> you can get an award for triple factor, quadruple factor authentication, you know, wh whatever you want. And some of these, you know, I said one or two person shops, all of a sudden that link to a, an award on your website you know, is part, you know, at, at uh, the domain hoster. And, you know, this is what it looks like when your customers click on it. Because uh, they don't need the extra money anymore. You know, maybe they got a job doing something else and they're not doing the awards thing anymore, so they didn't pay the, uh, uh, the registration fee. 
All these came from one vendor. And the problem that this creates, I mentioned before, there are some good uh, awards out there. There are some good programs out there. But how can you tell? This is a single vendor, and this is a tiny fraction of what this vendor has on their site, on the awards part of their site. How can you tell if, if uh, this is a good vendor? You can't tell anything about the product from this. I mean, maybe one or two of these will link to something that actually tells you something about the product from a third party who's independent from the vendor. Um, but I think in these cases, not a single one of these does that. You know, it's simply, it's, it might go to a park domain. And so, you know, I did a bit of a survey and found that most people don't even care about them anyway. You know, most people are aware that some of these awards are fake, and therefore, because some percentage are fake, they discount all of them. They ignore all of them. So it's not even worth doing anyway. And in fact, it's even worse than worthless. It could prevent you from getting customers. Some 38% of people, uh, if they see a bunch of awards like that, it's going to give them a red flag and they're going to go elsewhere. The awards, like, like I actually feel uh, pretty strongly that it's more sucky than it looks like. Like, like I think it's insane that we accept that somebody flat out lies to us and then buy their stuff. Because in the examples that you were looking at, like literally someone at the company said, okay, I'm gonna take my credit card, pay for this fake award, so that I can put it on my site and buy credibility. And like I was saying to Adrian, like, like if, if my doctor had one fake certificate on his wall, he wouldn't be my doctor anymore. But, but we totally fine with it uh, when vendors do it and everyone kind of shrugs. Um, and so while we're talking about unacceptable, um, we're going to go on to the next one, which is analysts. Um, and, and this one is a bit of a sore topic um, because, like, we've got analysts who are friends. Adrian was an analyst. Um, and there are people who are undoubtedly smart and undoubtedly nice. But this model that currently exists with analysts in the industry is broken. Okay, so, so how it typically works when someone wants to prove to you that there's nothing wrong with the way this works is they'll tell you that it's absolutely not pay for play. What happens is anyone can schedule time to brief an analyst. And then all you have to do is keep in that analyst's ear and keep him appraised of how your company is doing and then he'll write good stuff about you if you don't suck. And of course, the inquiring mind has to ask how do you keep in their ear and keep them updated? And the answer, does anyone know? Anyone? <laughs> exactly. So typically you pay $60,000 for this entry level thing and it allows you a minimum, number of, uh, minimum amount of time that you can spend with this analyst. But it's totally not pay for play. Um, like anyone can do it, um, but if you pay this amount of money, you're gonna get that amount of, of time. And in part, it's insane, because every time this has ever come up with me, like I genuinely feel slightly ragey about it. Um, and, and then you'll see that analysts um, in this position end up playing this crazy type of double game, right? Where they say, no, 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 you're not paying us for where we write about you. You're paying us because we talk to so many customers, we know what's good for you. So when you pay us, we talk to all these customers and we tell you how you should build your product. And our other neutral arm is the one that actually writes stuff about you. And, and if someone wants to make this statement, then I think what they need to do is try to sell one as a service without being able to do two. Let's see how many people pay them for their advice on the product when they're not also writing up uh, advice on what to buy. Um, a few years back, Richard Steenen, who was a consultant, uh, who was an analyst at Gartner, put out this book on how to influence analysts. And one of the things you notice, the thing that, that genuinely, uh, I think, gets in my craw the most, is everyone's aware that analysts have a great amount of power. And, and what you see from the book is how easy it is for power to corrupt. Um, and so what you'll see is uh, Richard has a section that says what you should consider doing is you know the airport that your analyst is going to go into. So buy ads 
in that analyst's airport. In fact, wouldn't it be cool if you actually quoted him in the ad? Because clearly that's, uh, that's the right way to go. And, and you see that going in grades, right? Because when they come over for the $60,000 analyst briefing, make sure you give them the best boardroom and make sure you give them nice food and I'm pretty sure you know what their favorite drink is, right? Because that's what you should be doing. Um, and actually, if you really want to impress them, go to their conferences and clap for their talks and try to get them promoted and tell your C CIO friends and CISO friends to make them more popular at their company because that's going to be good for you. Um, and of course, all of this just makes me rage insanely. Because what you'll notice is um, what you're going from is let's invest the time and make a product that people want or people need to let's make a product that analysts think people want. Okay, and for the most part, analysts, nobody is rushing out to buy hardware that was designed by Gartner. Okay, designed by Apple is, is a thing for a reason. Um, now, for us to speak about this is a little bit awkward because you end up kind of tilting at windmills, right? Even friends I know in really good, really popular companies will say, listen, don't fight this. Like, get someone on your team who knows how to brief analysts, pay the 60K, it's a analyst tax, and you'll be fine. Um, I don't want to. Um, for, for multiple reasons. Um, but, but probably the biggest reason I don't want to is because I think it's wasted effort. I think that the time that people are spending making sure that analysts are happy, they should be spending making sure customers are happy. And I think that's why we end up with software that VCs would choose or analysts would run, but that don't fundamentally help us. Um, so we end up in this crazy place where we're buying stupid ads that don't make sense, we alienate our customers, we burn our money in booths, um, and we build products that Gartner tells us to build. And the question is, why? And in part, it's because that's kind of worked till now. Like that's kind of what we've been doing. Except not really, right? Like, if you consider that we've got all these products and nobody takes a call from a security vendor, or we've got all these products and any pen tester says it's not even a speed bump, that's pretty much the definition of market failure. We've got all these products, but they don't do anything. Um, and again, the thing that keeps coming back is that there's no pushback against vendors for this. We see vendors saying ridiculous things and doing ridiculous things, and we don't push back. And I think for those of you who are here, for those who are smarter, you almost need to push back for a type of herd immunity to kind of save those who don't know better. We need to start uh, pushing vendors and telling them that that's not the way to roll. Um, it used to really be the only way to roll. Like I said, you want to start a company, that's what you need to do. Um, but there is some hope. Um, people were saying forever, security is too hard, enterprise sales is too hard, it's too hard to show value, you need these teams of guys in really good suits. Um, but you're starting to see hope from a few interesting places. If you've never seen this talk, um, this was a talk by John Flynn when he worked at Facebook. And he spoke about Facebook's two-factor authentication system called Two-Fact. And it's one of my favorite talks ever. You should, you should go watch it if you get a chance. And, and the problem they're running with is they've got tens of thousands of authentications happening every day inside Facebook by really smart engineers who know how to work around roadblocks that you put in front of them. And they needed to get two-factor authentication working. And if you watch the talk, you'll see literally dozens of times where John goes, so we had the solution, but it's not good enough. So we had the solution, but I think we can do better. And what he does is he and his team keep reducing friction. They put out a solution, they go, so we can use Duo security because it gets us out of the gate immediately, but actually we need to do this better. 
And then when they deploy what's almost the optimal solution, he goes to, OK, let's watch the logs to see how this is actually playing out. And they figure out some changes, and they rebuild it. And, and why I love it is he didn't go, these idiot users, they're not two-factor authenticating when they know that's safer. They refined it till two-fac is faster, a faster way to authenticate than not using two-fac. And so in the end, people use it because it's faster. It also happens to be more secure. Um, the other ray of hope we see is with some of the companies that have gone massive recently. Um, if you see Slack, Atlassian, GitHub, the whole argument that said you need teams of sales guys and all this ridiculous sales push. And what these companies have showed us is that actually, if you make your product nicely enough, if you make your product usable enough, Engineers in the organizations will pull you into the org from the bottom and pull you up. And these are companies now driving massive value, but they literally went into these orgs bottom up just based on the product, not based on uh, ridiculous sales and marketing. And, and when you see this, if you're a young product vendor, the first thing you go with is, but I'm not Slack, but I'm not in Silicon Valley, but, but we're not GitHub. And for that, um, in, in a tiny way, we are a reasonable opposite example. So we've not taken VC funding. Literally, we shipped hardware as our first product, which sounds like a completely stupid thing to do. And sitting down in South Africa, at this point, we've got customers on all seven continents, um, and, and literally with one sales guy. And, and the way we do it is just by making sure we're crazy about adding value um, so NPS scores are insane. I think we did our first vendor briefing when Adrian joined us, so four years into it, because for the most part, we didn't care what the analyst said. What we cared about was whether our users were saying nice things about us. Um, so the old way was you could build your tech, but you needed coin-driven sales. Um, you could build your tech, but you needed airport ads. The old way said you had to pay Gartner. The old way said you had to have eight touch points with every customer so that you could make your sale. And, and for the most part, um, we think it's time um, for the old ways to die. Um, so to sum it up, if you're a buyer, you need to start demanding more. You need to start pushing back more. And if you're a young company, um, there's actually hope. Where previously we needed to run our companies in ways we didn't want to, to reach customers. More and more, you can actually go pretty far just by caring about the product you build and caring about your users. Um, and that's all we've got, um, except for questions. Um, 